uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I've been looking for an opportunity to give this talk somewhere, so thank you for being my, my guinea pig. Uh, this is a talk on compiling with notations of intermediate languages and compilers and, and ultimately compiling with persistent data structures. Um, so I, I maintain an implementation of Scheme called Guile, and uh, we've been figuring out how we need to represent programs in the compiler recently, and we settled on a version of CPS, which is continuation passing style. And just to raise a hand, how many of you have heard the letters CPS like this together? How many of you have worked with continuation passing style compilers perhaps in the past, maybe just a few? Okay, uh, well, we're gonna start with a bit of history uh, and then move on uh, to the state of CPS in a, a more or less modern form uh, before discussing the, the precise formulation of um, an intermediate language in, in Guile CPS and then work through uh, some, how does it look when you're optimizing uh, based on using persistent data structures as the, as the representation of programs in the compiler and then finally look at like some strengths and weaknesses and things like that. So I, when I was researching this talk, I was really delighted to find that our craft has uh, deep and strong origins in like you know fundamental problems in math and philosophy, like the 20th century problems of like Whitehead and, and Hilbert and all these people. So in, in 1928 or so, uh, Hilbert came along with this can I you know this problem, which I'm going to try to pronounce by Entscheidungsproblem. I don't know if that's correct or not, but it, it's basically given a proposition. Is there a mechanical means which we can use to determine whether this proposition is, is generally true or generally false, right? And this is sort of an open question. And a few years later, in 1936, both Alonzo Church and Alan Turing came back with a decided no answer to this problem. And, and the way they did was by uh, encoding this problem using, into a, a, a certain notation with rules that govern the, the transformations on that notation. And, and then by using that notation, they were able to, to solve this problem in the negative. Uh, and Turing invented the Turing machine, which we all know about, and Church invented the lambda calculus. Um, and, and so it was, it was basically like a, a kind of a static analysis problem, right? Like statically an analyzing this proposition to see if it is true or false. Lambda calculus, uh, as it turns out, is super simple, right? And I, here it is, three, three points. There, there are only three things that can be in, in the untyped lambda calculus. You can have a variable reference, that's, a, that's an expression. You can have a lambda abstraction. We're used to think of lambdas as functions, but in general, it's, it's just an abstraction, a way to uh, bind a formal parameter and then have a term inside in which that formal parameter is in scope. And you can have an instantiation of that abstraction, an application. And, and that's the whole thing. It is Turing complete because it solved the same problem as, as this Turing's problem. Uh, and it, it's a way to represent computation. Um, so the, the salient points being that it, it introduces lexical scope. Lexical scope is the means for uh, data transfer, a and, to w and to compute with lambda calculus, you take this term, you have some mechanical rules for transformations you can do on them that preserve some property you're interested in, correctness or something, and you reduce it, which is kind of like compilation, right? That's what we do in the middle end of all of our compilers. But, you know, compilers didn't really exist then. Uh, but, uh, you know, time goes on, actual computers come to be, because I don't think digital computers were around in 1936. I wasn't around in any case. So I, I don't know. Uh, but in 1958, John McCarthy took the lambda calculus and said, wow, you know, we can actually express our programs in this. Uh, you just add a few things and, and we, uh, you end up with this magical eval function. And if, and if none of y'all, if y'all haven't read the, the 1958 paper by McCarthy in which he introduces eval and apply, it's lovely. It's like he takes like dirt and sticks together and makes magic and like makes a, a live human being. It's, it's really amazing. So it's like, yes, we can use lambda calculus for making programs, right? And okay, that's interesting. And then a few years later, uh, Peter Landon says, you know what, lambda calculus is actually useful for understanding programs. Because in the meantime, uh, people came along with Fortran, obviously the oldest language still in use. Lisp is the second oldest, which uh, McCarthy invented. Um, but the, the problem in the 60s was like, how do we even understand programming languages, you know, let alone programs? Uh, well, Landon said, well, actually, uh, if we, treat them in terms of this abstract machine, uh, this SCCD machine, which he invented back then, uh, we can understand them in terms of the lambda calculus. There's a correspondence between an algol program and a term in lambda calculus, and we can do reductions on that to see what does this program mean. Well, Landon had, Landon had a problem, which was go to, right? Um, I was like, what do we do about go to? Landon said, okay, I'm going to introduce an extra operator into my machine called the J operator. The J operator takes, it returns a lambda abstraction, but it's like a special one. 
it kind of rewinds the state of the abstract machine to some previous point. So J captures the state of the machine at some point, and then calling it uh, kind of rewinds the state to a, to a previous version. And so if you call uh, an abstraction created with the J operator, it's like go to. And if you, you know, in create an abstraction with a J operator, it's like making a label. So uh, it's, it's kind of nasty in a way, right? You're, you're adding something that maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it makes sense in the context of the machine, but is it minimal? Uh, well, it turns out um, just a year before, uh, Adrian Van Weingarten gave this presentation saying, you don't need this crazy J operator, which I guess had been published beforehand. He didn't communicate well <laughs> in, a, in a very interesting way. So there were years and years that passed uh, before uh, this idea came up that like you don't actually need the J operator. What you need to do is transform your program into th this way in, in that every jump target is can actually be a function, not a weird function made with J, but just like a normal function. And, and to, to preserve, to make it so that this is the case, you need to make a special uh, translation of your program. And, and then this was rediscovered a few years later. Incidentally, inspired by the actual code in the Lisp interpreter from previous days. They saw an instance of this pattern and said, hey, I can, I can actually transform programs to have this pattern. It's a little bit abstract, so here's an example uh, in Lua. Um, well, sort of in Lua, because it doesn't have the, the conditional operator like that. Uh, so in the beginning, we have a, a function, function f. Local x is I call foo if it's true. Then I call y. Otherwise, I call z. And then I return the value. Uh, below is the same program, but transformed into continuation passing style. It receives a continuation. Oh, you know what? I got a laser. I'm at a pseudo academic conference. I got a laser. That's great. So uh, it, it receives a continuation as the argument. Uh, and, and then ev every call in this is a tail call. Notice every time we call something, we're saying return, return, call something. Right? Uh, so th there's actually no, no stack in this program. So if you, if you call what is effectively a label, like the true continuation, the, the true branch of the if, it, it's really just calling a function. Uh, and, and I put it in Lua because Lua has tail calls. Uh, it has guaranteed tail calls, unlike uh, many other languages. And I didn't put it in Scheme because I, I need to ease you into my, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, indoctrinating people. It's great. Right, so um, uh, function calls turn to take continuation arguments. All the calls in it are tail calls. And then later on in 1970, uh, fellow Chris Wasser said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to call all these functions that are a result of the CPS transformation. I'm going to give them a name. That name is continuation. And the meaning of this thing is the rest of the program. Right? That, well, these functions are the meaning of the rest of the program, um, which was a notational uh, device which ex enhanced the expressive capacity uh, of, uh, of people when, when thinking about how to, how to work with programs in, in continuation. OK. Um, so that's uh, more on this semantic understanding program side. What about compilers? It took a few years, uh, but later on in the 70s, Guy Steele said, you know what, um, this continuation passing style is actually a, a good substrate for compilation. Because all of my calls are tail calls, uh, all of my calls are literally go-tos of some form. And if they pass arguments, then OK, I need to do some register allocation on those arguments. Maybe I need to push them on a stack or, or something. But I, it, the, the control is, is literally a, a go-to, and we can compile in this way. And, and he said in this great paper, Lambda the Ultimate uh, Imperative, uh, or Lambda the Ultimate Go-To, there was a series of Lambda the Ultimate papers, and some of them overlapped. But uh, check those out if you all haven't read the, them yet. A year later, he came out with a compiler called Rabbit, uh, which transforms the scheme program into continuation passing style and proceeds to make all of the calls uh, go-tos. And so if you're not falling through from one continuation to the next, then you need to actually emit the go-to, otherwise it's just falling straight through. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, this uh, group built uh, this Orbit compiler, uh, which did a lot more optimization. So it was, uh, the Rabbit compiler was a bit simplistic in some ways, and, and Orbit was, was a bit better. OK, so that's a kind of history of one tribe of computing. Right? The, the Lambda tribe is progressing on its road, like uh, completely oblivious to what people are doing in the machine tribe with Fortran and everything else. So what, what happened in the meantime? For, to my mind, uh, the, the interesting thing that happened was flow analysis and all the transformations that you can do using flow analysis. In 1970, uh, Fran Allen and John Cock together uh, developed uh, flow analysis. John Cock, interestingly, I understand he's uh, 
sometimes called the father of risk, which is kind of like the full employment act for uh, compiler writers in the sense that you know, we always want to be able to do these transformations in order to eke out the performance that, that, that we can get. So all of the, the transformations that we are still doing today and still trying to make happen on our programs, uh, well, many of them at least were, were invented in the 70s, and this was not part of, of the Lambda tribe. So as part of the Orbit uh, project, <laughs> there's a very interesting thing that happened. It's like, okay, we need some flow analysis. And, and this fellow, Owen Shivers, said uh, he tried it and he failed. It was a wonderful failure. <laughs> and the problem is that in, in a program which has been transformed to continuation passing style, control and data, it's, a, it, it, it's the same thing. You don't have a control flow analysis on which to do your data flow analysis. You don't have a data flow analysis on which to do your control flow analysis. You need to do them both at the same time. And he failed, right? Because he didn't understand how to do it. And okay, right, okay. So there, there are two solutions to this in practice. And the first is a family of algorithms which Shivers later developed in a PhD thesis called the KCFA uh, family of algorithms. CFA, I think, initially stood for control flow analysis, but obviously it does data flow at the same time. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a family of algorithms that are parameterized as to how precise you want to get. Zero CFA can handle uh, just functions. Uh, one CFA will distinguish uh, higher order function calls, functions which take functions as arguments. Two CFA will take functions which take functions which take functions as arguments. Uh, and, and you can, it, it is a flow analysis algorithm that you can determine at every point, every call f of x, uh, what values flow to f and what values flow to x. So you have the information you need to determine types and all sorts of things in your program. Well, what happens? It's um, intractable, right? Uh, one CFA and above are, uh, have been formally proven to be exponential suck, right? So we can't use them in, in real compilers. And, and even zero CFA is quadratic. There are, approximate, there are you know, even sub-zero CFAs, which uh, try to be not quadratic. There, there are some linear ones, but I mean, it's, it's not really a basis for uh, a production compiler or flow analysis. Um, so the other thing that we can do is separate continuations into two kinds. And if you make, I know you, you just glanced at the, the transformation I had before, but there are three kinds of continuations in this transformation. And I tried to put them in bold, but they don't really show up too well on the screen. So one is a return point from a call, right? A return point from a call has a certain calling convention, okay? Another is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, this is uh, the entry point to a call. And the entry point to a, a function call in the source program has a certain calling convention if you haven't specialized it to a, a particular one. Uh, return point has another calling convention. And, and these appear you know, in, in bold here. And the other one is uh, a jump target. So some continuations are only ever like, bound within your function and then used in operator position. And these are literally, th these are the ones which you can tie together to make a first order uh, control flow. So by separating your, uh, your continuations which are used in a conventional way from uh, lambda terms which are passed as data, which are functions in your source program, then you can regain the separation of control and data flow. Uh, and interestingly, in, in, in the mid-90s, the question was, well, where does this leave us as regards SSA? And SSA in a minute. But, um, well, so as far as compilation goes, uh, we can compile these as jumps. So we, we've regained this um, control flow graph on which we can do uh, data flow analysis. Uh, and this is the approach which is also recommended in, in Apple's Compiling Continuations book. So, what about SSA? Well, the machine tribe, which uh, I think I'm in a room of, of machine tribe folks here, uh, moved a little bit towards the Lambda tribe, I, I think, with uh, the advent of SSA. Because um, the, the people that developed SSA wanted to do global value numbering. They wanted to do transformations based on global value numbering. And this is too hard with the notation they had before. Instead of reasoning about assignable places to which you know, multiple values could flow, they wanted to reason about values that were bound to identifiers and not necessarily assigned to locations. And by using a different notation, uh, they were able to make uh, other transformations. Incidentally, it turns their program into a functional program. So every SSA variable is, is only, since it's only bound once, it's never assigned. Uh, SSA is functional programming. And, and there's a lovely article uh, published in, in the late 90s called SSA is Functional Programming that I, I think it's very approachable and very nice to read. Additionally, earlier in the, in the decade, SSA and CPS were proven formally equivalent provided you use CPA, uh, continuations in the, 
not, not as first class values, more always in the conventional style. And so the, the correspondence between the, the two uh, conditions are then SSA, obviously, definitions dominate uses, and CPS uh, is that your uses are always in scope, which entails that, you're def that because you're the things that bind variables, uh, the things that create the scope dominate the things that are inside it, then it, it, it ensures this condition. So they, they really are formally equivalent. And if in modern terms, uh, I, if anyone wants to try implementing a compiler based on CPS, I definitely recommend uh, the 2007 article by Andrew Kennedy, compiling with continuations continued. Uh, so modern CPS in his form, nested scope, and syntactic differentiation between uh, continuations and variables. So um, they're just two separate identifiers and, and continuation identifiers can only be used in, in certain syntactic places and, and data variables like first class functions can only be used in certain others. Okay, so why, so Andy, Andy, why are you telling me all this thing? Why, so okay, why, why even bother with this history of, of CPS? Besides the interesting bit about, you know, the Entscheidung problem and all that. Okay, uh, so I think that um, the folks that come from the SSA tradition are, are very much concerned about loops, right? Loops and scheduling, very low level stuff. Whereas people that have worked with CPS come from a more functional languages program, uh, uh, tradition in which uh, it's all about functions, right? How can I compile functions? What sort of good optimizations can I do on functions? What sort of optimizations can I do on on programs with GC and tail calls and all sorts of this sort of thing. So I think that these two uh, traditions, so to speak, should be both drawn on, you know, and, and you should get a, a compiler that can do both. Uh, and as an example of, of one of these optimizations, um, I guess folks have heard of contification, perhaps. Uh, some, not very many. No? Okay. Oh, this is a great one. So in a language with tail calls, if you have uh, a function or a clique of functions that tail call each other, and they all continue they're the same place, they all return to the same continuation as a group, then they can be wired directly into their call site. And unlike inlining, this is never a code growth optimization. So it always makes your term bigger. It's, it's a, you know, a mother optimization like inlining. Uh, but unlike uh, inlining, it's always a good idea, right? So it's, it's a really great uh, transformation you can do uh, on a program. But it requires that you think in terms of uh, functions and, and nested functions. But well, nested functions ideally, but you can also do it with with other, uh, with functions that don't share a nested scope. Um, and, and I think the CPS language facilitates it, uh, first of all, by the idea of the continuation, that you can, you know, think about all these functions actually having the same continuation and having that continuation have a name in your program. And also, if, if your program is cast in a form such that your continuation names are, are, are globally unique across procedures, and your variable names are globally unique across procedures, then you can integrate that function into the, uh, you can integrate the, that function or set of functions into its call site without even renaming your variables. You just sort of rewire you know, what, how you call the function and, and how you return from it. You, re, you, you turn um, data flow into control flow. Uh, and if you are in a language with nested scope, then having interprocedural scope in your intermediate language does help for these transformations. It's possible in SSA too, right? These are formally equivalent. You can do this in SSA. However, it comes from this sort of tradition of CPS. So if you know like the kinds of transformations people do on functional programs, then you know, it might help you think more. You know? Different notation might help you think about problems in a better way. Okay, so I, I tried out CPS in Guile and I got to a big irritation in, in the end. So um, I, I mentioned that the, the, the condition was that variable uses must be in scope, but that doesn't like, just because a variable is in scope doesn't mean, like, not all variables which are in scope dominate the, the, the uses. And here's an example, right? And, and we transform trees all the time. And so as you transform the tree, you need to uh, preserve this static proof term, which is effectively the scope that ensures that your uses are in scope. So in this case, I have my block. I call k1. k1 binds a value v1. And then it calls k2, and then in k2 I want to use the value v1, but v1's not in scope, right? And yet k1 dominates k2. And so having to preserve this nested scope is really irritating, it turns out. In, in common sub-expression elimination, quantification, I ran this as well. Um, and, and Fluid and Weeks, who had this compiler, Milton, it's a high-performance cold program uh, compiler for ML, they switched from uh, CPS to SSA because of this issue in, in 99. 
Um, so the, this presentation, uh, sort of getting more to the meat and the concrete bits, uh, is about a formulation of CPS without an SE scope. So instead of having uh, you know, scopes, you have the SSA thing, where the variables available for use at any given program point are the variables which dominate, you know, the variables which were defined in dominating continuations, labels, blocks. These are the same thing from the perspective of this uh, analysis. So your program then becomes an undifferentiated soup of continuations or, or CPS soup, uh, as we call it. Okay, so here's a uh, type description in, in typed racket. I thought it was like the nicest, shortest way to uh, describe types. So I don't, I've never actually programmed type racket before. We'll, we'll see if this works. So in Gala, a label is a small integer, right? A natural number. And a program is an entry label and then a map from label to continuations, right? Okay, great. Uh, a variable is also a small integer. A variable of one is different from a continuation of one because they're syntactically distinguished. Uh, I have a list of variables. And I have, uh, we actually have five kinds of continuations in Gala, but in, here I'll just put three. Uh, an entry continuation, uh, an expression which holds the expression, and an exit. Exit is, a, is sort of the tail continuation. An entry contains the link to its body and a link to the exit, and then an expression contains the set of variables which are bound by that expression. They're like the formal parameters of a lambda term. Uh, the k, the continuation that it, continu that it, it continues to, uh, and the expression itself, and then a continuation is the union of those three types. And then here we get to something that's looking a bit more normal. Uh, Prim call is like an intrinsic call. Uh, you have operation and some arguments. Uh, interestingly, branch uh, contains, it will branch by default to the false continuation, which is the one contained in the K expr. But if the embedded expression, ah, I have, a, I have a laser. If the embedded expression is true, then I will branch to the KT, the, the true condition. Uh, otherwise, a normal call, constants even have their own things. Uh, here is a, creates a function given an entry label. And uh, here's how we pass, uh, here's our, our go-to effectively. If we need to emit go-to or if we need to emit like a uh, loop back edge or, or something like that or some sort of phi condition, um, we can pass some number of arguments to some other continuation. And the expression is the union of all of these. And if, you, if you're actually interested in this, we have more details there. Okay, uh, here is an example of the compilation of this simple program. So we have a, a function if, and we call foo, uh, and if foo is true, we'll call y, and otherwise we'll return false. So we have map, we begin with k entry. The k1 is the, the body, and the k10 is the exit. So k10 is the exit. k1 receives no values, continues to k2 with the constant foo. Constant foo then becomes bound to v0 within this expression, which I look up v0 and continue to k3. I call th that value, and I continue to k4. I branch, here's the interesting bit. So if the values of V1 is true, then I continue to K8, or no, I think I did this wrong then. It's, it's actually reversed. So imagine there's like a knot here. Yeah, pretty rad, miscompilation. Okay, so <laughs> let's say, uh, okay, I can continue to K8, which I make a constant, and I continue with it to the exit. That's, that's that one case. Otherwise, um, so, our variable lookup is not actually like this, but this is an example. Let's say I take the constant y, I look it up again, and then I call uh, that, that y function, and I continue also to the exit, right? Okay, uh, and this is the program, combined with the, the idea that k0 is the entry. k4 like pull through that, No, no, no. k4 either continues to k5 or to k8, so if it falls through to k5, it's because uh, this expression was false. So this is the false continuation, that's the true continuation. Yeah. Uh, so right, uh, the variables that are available for use at a given site are the flow property. Uh, they're bound by this k expert, like lambda form formal parameters, and the values are given by the predecessors to the term. Uh, expressions have labels to which they continue, and you return by continuing to the k exit, uh, and including tail calls. We have two phases, incidentally, of CPS and Guile. We have one which is higher order in which we have a, a nested scope, and we have one which is first order in which we've chosen representations for closures, and that any variables which are free in a function are referenced through the, the closure variable. And, and this, is, this is really nice, actually, because in the same way that SSA is binding instead of assignment, it's really nice to be able to think about nested scope in terms of binding instead of assignment to some place, which might be some 
closure object or some lambda object. I don't know if y'all are compiling uh, the C++ lambdas these days. Um, I, I imagine it's you need to do some mem to reg or something in order to, to get bindings for those variables. Um, right, so about those maps. There are some people I understand that understand things innately by types. Uh, and for those people, uh, this slide is up here uh, without any commentary whatsoever, except that like a map has a min, a shift, and a root. But most people understand them by pictures, so I drew this picture. <laughs> when I was giving this talk uh, before, I, I realized I needed some pictures. So this, this bit, which is actually green in here, these boxes represent memory words. Uh, here's our minimum, here's our shift, and here's our root. This is the empty set. Uh, um, the root is empty. That's, that's the salient bit here. Right? So empty set, so empty, great. Right? So let's say we have a, uh, an association between 1 and A. Our minimum is now 1. Our shift is 0. Um, and, and our root just contains the value itself. So the range of this map is going to be the minimum, inclusive, and to the minimum plus 2 to the shift, which is 1 to 2. It, this is not inclusive. And the minimum is aligned to two to the power shift, so I can do efficient union. So if I have two values, one to A and three to B, so uh, these things, the shift increments by some constant amount, depending on your implementation of these persistent data structures. In Guile, it's five, so we have 32-way branching at each point. Uh, I think it's five. I have to check. In this example, it's two, just so I can fit this, you know, four-way branching on the slide. So let's say we have one is A and three is B. Okay, this this is our minimum. Is our shift, so our range is from 0 to 3, right? Uh, so 0, 1, 2, 3. 1 holds A, 3 holds B, and there's nothing in, in uh, 0 or 2. Uh, right. So now we get to some interesting bits, and, and here I have a, a little uh, editing. So let's take our, our example from before, right? This is exactly what we had before. And we add it. Let's say we're going to do a union. Uh, between an association of 2 and C. So our minimum 2, our shift is 0, and C. What we end up getting is a new data structure. All these boxes represent new words in memory. A lot of allocation, isn't it? So our result is minimum of 0, our shift of 2, and then we have A, C, and B there on the right. And then finally, we get to the interesting thing. So if we add them together 1 and A and 3 and C, or plus 4 in D and 5 in E, what I see is that like these, these minimums, these have the same shift of 2, but the minimum is 0 in this one and 4 in this one. So what's going to happen is we add another level to the tree, but we reference the existing data structures. And because these are persistent and immutable, uh, the cost of adding to this data structure is log n inside. Uh, and, and it depends on your, your log factor as to what, what this precise cost is. Uh, but you end up sharing state if you're if you're working over many, many, many labels. Uh, it, it gets to be very cheap when you're doing uh, unions, for example, because you can compare things by equality and not actually traverse their subtrees and, and, and such. But this has many, many characteristics, and I will, uh, I'll go over the advantages and the disadvantages a little bit later. So what it is, is it's, this is an array map tree. That's the name of the data structure. They were pioneered by Phil Bagwell around 2000 or so, and they were famously adopted by Clojure. And uh, Clojure uses them as their fundamental data structure. Um, they are O n log n in size, uh, reference and update are, are log n, but if you visit each, you can imagine just visiting each of these arrays, it, it's very near linear. And, and the other thing is that unions and intersections are very cheap, which is great for our work, because we're always thinking in terms of unions and intersections, and things like that. Uh, and and Clojure actually added something on top of this, which was if you use them in a linear way, in, in a linear types way, if you, um, if you locally are building up some sort of data structure by you know, local addition, you don't need to allocate so much you can actually mutate them in place. And, and Clojure's transient, which I, if you're interested, go to this website, it's a very nice uh, introduction to this problem, shows how you, how you do this without causing so much allocation. Uh, I think it's still n log n, I'm not sure, uh, but it, it's much faster in practice. So that's the thing, and we use it sometimes as well. Uh, usually when building like higher order abstractions, like I'm going to be working on locally some sort of data structure, um, so I, I, I will, First, like create a transient data structure that I'm going to work on, and then I, I kind of freeze it at the end by calling persistent. And this is an O1 operation. Okay, well, there, there's lots more details there, but we'll, we also have uh, integer maps which are specialized to integers as the values, and they're, they're bit sets. And the salient point is that the leaf 
on these is the UN32, so it represents, uh, what is it, like five values or something? Oh, no, 32 values. Yes? No. Sometimes I get with, confused with these, so I, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. <laughs> so we have transient variance of these two. The point being is that, like, when you're writing a compiler, right, you, you're always turn, talking in terms of like sets of labels, sets of variables, maps of variables to this data structure, maps of this to that, and, and, and you're doing unions and intersections and everything. This gives you a very nice way to, to think about this uh, on, a, it, uh, it, on, a, on a notational level. Like it makes, makes things quite, quite simple somehow. So as an example, let's go through uh, an example transformation on a program expressed in terms of these uh, uh, persistent data structures. Uh, this is going to be an unboxing example. So in Scheme, we have numbers, right? And I know this is just completely like <laughs> amazing, right? And there are numbers like like proper integers that, that don't have arbitrary precision limits and fractions and complex numbers and exact complex numbers and inexact complex numbers. And, I mean, it's just a mess, right? And <laughs> if you want to compile this, you need to like choose, if you can, use the machine data type so that you actually get some good performance here. And so you need to do some kind of flow analysis to determine which values you can unbox and use machine data types instead of um, these higher order polymorphic data types. So in the next three slides, I show the, the path for a simple version of unboxing and add one instruction. You know, just add one so that we are able to fit everything on this slide. And, and there's a lot of detail, uh, but I don't know. Y'all work on compilers, so this is my audience. I gotta present this somewhere. Okay, so here's our unbox path. We're gonna take our conf, which is immutable, immutable data structure. So I just get another reference to it here. So I let, let out equals conf. I made up this pseudo language. Isn't that terrible? Oh well. So uh, first thing we do is we, we take these uh, continuations and we determine which functions are in them. This is not a thing which, which is immediately apparent. I have to trace the graph to determine from the entry which continuations are, are actually referenced in the function. And, and I do this because it, it's possible to do it in some faster ways, but it's, it's often the case that a transformation leaves around a stale uh, continuation and sometimes you wanna actually go through and only have live continuations in, in a program and sometimes you don't care. Uh, so here I identify the entry and then the body is a set of uh, labels. A set of labels identifying the continuations in this function. So first of all, I do a local type inference on that function using the control, the local control flow graph and I get uh, some sort of type and range analysis for all the variables which are used in this. And I'm not showing the, the, the body of this but I'll show use of it in the future. For every, for every label in the body, I look up the continuation with that label. And I don't know, C++ still does not have pattern matching, right? I, I'm, it's, I'm so sorry, right? So, because so, you really wanted it to go by there, right? So if the continuation is an expression, whose variables we're going to bind to vars, whose continuation we bind to k, and whose expression is a prim call, whose operation is add one, and whose operand is add, if I can unbox it, then I'll unbox it. Otherwise, uh, if it's not one of these, then I'll just pass and just leave it as it is. In the end, I, I just return the, the function in the end. Uh, right. So uh, let's do the can unbox function. Uh, this, is, this is where we get a little bit interesting. Okay, let's look. So here I have the label, which is my continuation. The K, which is where the label continues. All right. So not the label identifying the, the unboxing expression itself, but the label identifying the successor. So I look up the successor to get the name of the variable that I'm defining. It's not immediately apparent. It's kind of irritating, isn't it? So, but that's how it is. Uh, so I get the name of the variable I'm defining. I look up its type after my expression being, is it an integer or something else or what? This is a set. And do I have a minimum and maximum value for it? I look up the type of A which flows into the label and if these types are unboxable, meaning it's an integer and it's in the range that I want to unbox, maybe it's a 32-bit integer or whatever, then I'll return true. Okay. Finally, the actual unboxing path. Uh, I take, you know, label, same, same things up here. Uh, first thing I need to do is generate some fresh variables. A fresh variable is a variable which is not present in the program, which is not bound in the program. So it's a function of the program. So I call this, and, and you can just look and see what is the last uh, what, what is the greatest integer in your map? And, and then return a couple more. So I get a couple of variables for the, uh, uh, the unboxed argument, because we're gonna unbox our argument. And then I get a, a value for the unboxed result. And we're going to unbox in the beginning and then box in the end. And then hope that some later, later compiler path removes these excessive boxes. So that's 
and I get uh, likewise fresh labels for, for those operations. So I replace the label in a functional way, I'm not modifying the input. I, I make a new uh, program, which has replaced my uh, initial expression with an unboxing of that value. And then I use, I bind the unboxed value because it continues to k op. So I'm, I'm adding my new fresh continuation. I use my unboxed value and I pass it to k box. I make my continuation k box. I continue to the original continuation k with the result of boxing my result. And then usually some other pass will come and remove either this box or this box and then you win, right? If no, if no pass removes these boxes, then maybe you lose. But usually you win, so that, that's why we do it. Um, and, then, and then you return you know, this map. And, and that, that's your, you're done, right? So what are, the, what are the points about this transformation that are interesting relative to, say, basic blocks and you know, usual formulation like might be in LVM or something like that? Okay, so to get their name of the results, I have to look forward. And I don't have a reference to my predecessor. So that means that you don't know if your successor has multiple <coughs> predecessors. So you don't know if the variable you're binding is a five variable or not. Effectively, you have to treat all variables as five variables, which means you always have to do like some sort of flow analysis to, to determine, like for example, your types or to determine whether something could be in box or something like that. On the other hand, you, you end up making like all global operate, like you never end up making a local optimization that only works within one basic block. You always end up making an oper a global one which works on the, on the function level, uh, which is kind of cool in a way. Like you never have to hit this lame intermediate point, although it might rob you of a paper. I don't know, because maybe you publish first your local optimization and then you publish your global one. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure like, if we're optimizing a paper count here. So, <laughs> so as an example, uh, a backwards flow, if you take a, uh, an expression like x and, and x is an arbitrary precision integer, but you only want the lower 32 bits, you can't just reach through from this expression to x. You have to do a flow analysis to determine uh, which, which bits are needed from which expression. But, you know, it works across five variables, which is kind of cool. Um, right. So, uh, speaking of basic blocks, where are they? Right? We, we, we don't have them uh, in this representation. They aren't necessary in the sense that like, okay, every term is identified by a label. Every continuation has its associated label. So we can always talk about you know, labeled terms or, or values and such. We don't actually need basic blocks. On the other hand, it does augment considerably the n in our on or on log n or, or what have you, our, 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 our passes we're doing on the program. So maybe good, maybe bad, I don't know. Um, in, the, in the specific context of Guile, we do need globally unique uh, names for, for terms so that, that a value might have two names, the fact that it's in this one basic block and also has a, a, a name because of its, its expression within that basic block is kind of irritating when we're doing transformations. So if things just have one name, uh, not basic block plus value, but just value, then that's useful for us, but in Guile, we have many terms that, that bail out, right? And, and I understand that um, a number of compilers these days are, are representing bailouts in a, in a different way than uh, a nest of basic blocks. B but because of this, if we did represent things properly as all basic blocks, our, our graph would be quite enormous, I think. Uh, so we'd end up with a similar size structure. So it, it's, it's kind of okay to have every term have its label. And, and, and oddly, we always do flow analysis. We, I, our, our loop detection stuff <laughs> is terrible. It doesn't detect nests or loops, it just detects the nests. Uh, so for that, we don't need dominators. Uh, so it, it, it's just an odd result that I, you know, I've used dominators in the past, but I, I end up just always falling back to full flow analysis. It, it works better for, for us. Okay, so the strengths and weaknesses at this point. Uh, and, and then we get to questions, because I'm sure it doesn't all make sense. <laughs> So the strengths of this uh, notation are that it's, it's very simple, right? I mean, it, you don't have to deal with, with places for one. You don't have to worry about when you're making a transformation on a program, uh, can I refer back to the program, like my, my source program coming in, or have I modified it to the extent that like maybe I'm not referring to the same thing? The persistent data structures are, are very, they cleared up my mind. I, I, and there were a few optimizations in which 
I was not able to perform them optimally. I wasn't actually able to code them. As a single person, like mostly single person working on this, uh, uh, mar married person, but like single hacker <laughs> working on this compiler, um, I, I need to fit these things in my head. And, and using persistent data structures and a simple uh, IR did help me uh, actually code up some optimal uh, transformations, which I was not able to do before. Um, the inner procedural bindings, uh, very nice uh, when before closure conversion to be able to have a nested function refer to a value from an outer function. Uh, and the, the space complexity is okay, right? In terms of if you do a flow analysis, in this case like uh, the type and range analysis at every point for every variable that's in the scope, uh, it, it's, it's pretty good. I think it's in again uh, because at every, at every point in your flow analysis you're adding effectively just the uses and definitions to the graph and those are uh, log n in, in complexity both in time and space. Um, in time it's a little bit, um, it, it's slower than what I had before, uh, but in space it, it's quite good. Uh, compared to SSA, um, it, it's, it's got the same frustration scheduling wise that SSA does. You know, when you do your, your transformation SSA, everything is stuck, right? And then you try to move things. Like everything is stuck in the loop and then you try to hoist them out, right? And that's, that's a lot of our work. Whereas if you have uh, more data flow based intermediate language, uh, like C of nodes or one of these things, you don't stick things in place in, in a control sense. You, you let your, your value and control dependency graph, uh, as you pull out the results from the function, things get scheduled in a much more nice way. And, and CPS has the same disadvantages as, as SSA in this regard. The flow analysis, um, well, the continuations, the, there are more continuations than there are basic blocks, so your, your order is higher. Uh, and, and you have an additional log n factor for most of the operations on the, the intermediate uh, language. Additionally, because it's not direct pointer usage as you have, you, you end up doing a lot of pointer chasing and, and redirecting in this log n thing. So I may, maybe it's an issue. You know, uh, additionally, sometimes you might want to renumber the graph if you want to conveniently always visit nodes in a certain order. If you, if you take a set of labels, it's, it's easy to be able to traverse the set from beginning to end, but, but only if your labels are actually topologically ordered or ordered in the way you want to do so, is it actually um, optimal to do that. So sometimes you end up having to renumber your graph so that your labels are in topological order, for example. Um, the values which flow into five errors, you can somehow value, sometimes have values that don't have any names. Uh, so you have the name for the, for the result, but not necessarily a name for every input. It could probably be fixed, but I don't know. Lots of allocation, uh, although ways to mitigate it in C++. And, and you're always, like there's no place in, in, the, in the intermediate representation to store your analysis. Like even what are my predecessors? Every time you do a transformation, like things get renumbered, so you're always throwing this away. Okay, like th those, are, those are sort of disadvantages. On the other hand, well, the, the better notation has helped me to, to transfer programs. So if I stay in basic blocks, works for you, it's great, you know, super, right? But, but if, it, if you're finding problems, then maybe consider uh, transforming your program into an equivalent notation uh, that might be easier for you to express solutions. And, and this graph of CPS names, uh, it, it's worked for me. Maybe it could work for you. So that, that's the whole thing. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, what do I have? Like two, two minutes for questions. So if there are any, uh, go ahead. Oh.